chat G P T. Wow. I mean, um, who can deny that the only thing that is certain is uncertainty? And I think that's basically where the start and end of the whole debate around the use of chat GPT in academia lies, really. Um, so where do I begin? I mean, it's something that has taken higher institution or, you know, higher education globally, really, um, by storm. Um, and I think if I'm honest, I think the anxiety surrounding the rise, um, the use and basically how chat GTP is mimicking or mimics human intelligence, the anxiety that is the, you know, at the center of everything is the fact that people feel that they are going to be replaced and ultimately they're going to be jobless. And that's a pretty valid um, concern. And, you know, it's valid for people to be afraid. Um, I think that is more of the concern rather than, you know, the ethics of cheating and plagiarism. Um, because, of course, you know, plagiarism and cheating and academic integrity um, is something that definitely forms educational malpractice. But um, if it doesn't affect you directly, I mean, it's human nature to not be concerned with things that aren't your problem until they become your problem. So, you know, a student might cheat on a paper and, you know, in terms of your own ethics for yourself and for, you know, the environment that you work in you feel inclined to report the student and make them undergo the whole process for um plagiarism of work but obviously the extent to how that affects you is in the bigger picture because until somebody infringes your own copyright somebody um copies your work and passes it off on as their own or monetizes um, something that you've put your blood sweat and tears into it doesn't really hit home um, but obviously plagiarism you know any kind of academic malpractice is just something that we kind of uphold because one day you know the repercussions can come and bite us in the ass and I think with chat gtp chat gpt sorry I keep calling it chat, chat gtp I think what um the real concern is that basically we're going to be replaced and nobody's going to need um, anyone to write anything. Therefore, teaching is going to decline. Research is going to decline. Um, and with AI and the way I, AI has or is replacing uh, human resourcing or manpower or apparently I'm not allowed to say manpower. I was... Um, I was called out in saying manpower because apparently it's very sexist. So the politically correct word is workforce, but I'm going to call it manpower because I can <laughs> and I will. <laughs> so, um, you know, computers replacing manpower, basically. I think we considered it to be uh, a problem that doesn't necessarily affect um more intellectually challenging jobs. So for example, you know, um, self-checkouts and things like that. And actually my mum is somebody who advocates for self-service checkouts to not replace cashiers. So she would go to a supermarket and request for the actual checkout to be open. And the people working there who tend to kind of be, you know, younger, people will kind of be annoyed and what usually happens is they will stereotype um, her because obviously my mum is visibly Muslim she wears hijab and she's black um, so they'll kind of think automatically you know she can't use um, self-service checkout because she's illiterate unfortunately that is a stereotype um, and that's something she comes across um, which 
obviously um, couldn't be further from the truth. And even if it was truth, you know, you can argue that the fact that somebody is illiterate and cannot use any kind of self-service device still warrants um, some form of basic respect in terms of customer service. But um, I digress. Um, the point I'm making is my mother would actually actively like challenge and say, look, I'm advocating for you. If we all use these self-service checkouts, then you're going to be out of a job. Um, and she stands by that. She refuses to use them. She will always request for um, being served by a checkout. And I think um, personally for me, I do definitely enjoy a human interaction. And I think um, definitely sometimes in the morning, because I like to go out and shop in the morning um, really early. So my local supermarket, like around 6.37, um, there are specific checkout ladies who I go to and we have a morning chat. And I think I never fully appreciated the extent of that until um, the whole lockdown situation that we faced for two years. Um, so definitely now, I mean, before lockdown, I would happily stay in my home um, for a week as long as I had food and internet I really didn't care and tv I really didn't care to kind of you know go out um, but definitely post-lockdown life changed that for me I think things I took for granted I definitely appreciate human interaction a lot more there are benefits of obviously um, remote working and remote living that we do but I think I really appreciate a hybridity and the you know combining the benefits of both um, so obviously that transcends into the use of chat gtp because essentially why i'm using the analogy of self-service checkouts is because it, before it was seen as an uh, them them problem not an us problem um and you know i you know forgive me uh if you kind of feel that this offends you in any way because definitely that isn't my um mission here um if anything, I do um, try to keep what I put on this particular channel of mine as neutral as possible. Obviously, my personality is my personality and I'm I'm not um, going to water that in any way. But I think in terms of like um, overly leaning to any kind of political ideology, I think that's for my other channel. Um, but this channel is more of what it's supposed to be. So just more, you know, um, just a, a straight... Um, more fact-based, knowledge-based hub, really. What I'm trying to say is basically, I think with um, a lot of issues where any kind of restructure happens, whether it's within a company, an institution, or in society in general, it's more seen as a working class problem or a lower income people problem. So obviously the benefit um, or a privilege that people enjoy working in higher institutions as academics and as researchers is that there is a middle class privilege that comes to it. Um, and that's undeniable um, whether or not that um, sounds nice or not. It is true. It's um, It's really seen as, you know, the intellectuals are kind of protected because of their intellectual privilege. And, you know, I have mentioned before that privilege is something that regardless of, you know, um, race or um, any other characteristics, I think all people have um, access to a type of privilege um, that puts you ahead. And I think that's, that's why it's even more important for, equity because equity recognizes when there are certain privileges and others do not have that so basically the level ground isn't level the playing field sorry isn't level for everyone um but again let's let's pull back to the point i think the reason why i kind of provided this um tangential context is because i think it can't be ignored I, like i said i think the the main issue is the fact that um not that chat GTP will really affect, you know, students' um, creativity or their ability to work independently and produce um, thought-provoking critical work. It really is because people feel threatened um, or perhaps people who enjoy a certain 
societal privilege, whether it's you know intellectual privilege or um, a class privilege, that oh, you know, there is a real possibility that we could be overhauled and replaced, <laughs> and there's going to be um, a scarcity in teaching and research opportunities, um, which obviously that has a direct impact on our livelihood. And I think that is where the uproar and the panic comes from, rather than, oh, you know, students really shouldn't be doing this. This is, you know, unethical. It's, you know, academic malpractice and etc. cetera. Um, if students can use AI to produce assessments um, and then what next um, is the AI going to actually replace lecturers and tutors and examiners supervisors um, that's really where the the anxiety is um so my own perception of chat gtp so um initially i just really wasn't on board with it i really didn't know much about it until the last four months and um it was something that in the university that i um work in we obviously that's something that came up um and like i said again i at this point i wasn't familiar with it so about four four months ago and people were like you know students are using chat gtp it's this as play there's issues surrounding plagiarism but then i realized that the issues regarding chat gtp plagiarism wise wasn't um necessarily to do only with plagiarism and academic integrity etc it really was to do with shit we are replaceable and we may be replaceable faster than we can actually catch our breath or even blink so um I was like oh, okay like whatever and then there was um you know things came up in department meetings and people were like this needs to be addressed there needs to be a serious address of this problem yes chat gtp um so we move into 2023 i still don't really get a feel for this um, ai tool and it goes on uh students and uh, what what's happened is basically students are using chat gtp for assessment purposes and um what's happening is that there's no clear guidelines within university assessment policy that says this falls into cheating basically plagiarism or any kind of academic malpractice getting an ai tool to write your essays um so that because that's a gray area and it's obviously an emerging area fastly rapidly you know changing in terms of pretty much almost every day um something is new um and the mechanics of how to bring about policy change in education is slow it's slow it requires um the initial uproar and kind of you know um unsettling uh people running around like headless chickens and then um there's a sit down a kind of um you know briefing of what's going on and then from there there needs to be actual now you can fast track it of course but there needs to be research and discussions and everything until something is done and policy comes into effect um meanwhile chat gdp is faster and smarter and more used than ever so I actually did have a play around with it um, and I can't deny that it is something that definitely in the most underrated term will revolutionize the way that we teach and the way that we write and the way that we assess at higher education um, institutions um, and 
my colleagues share this sentiment and actually the person who initially brought this as you know oh my god this is a real problem that we need to address is somebody who now um is also on the bandwagon that hang on a second this tool is actually really good and it does things that are make our lives easier really um so bearing that in mind um chat gtp has entered the chat and is not going to leave any time in the infinite future really there's no way like human beings don't think oh my god this is so easy and this is so cool and um you know so easy so cool makes my life so much easier oh no but i'm not going to use it because it may put people out of a job and it may have like implications that are unethical. People don't think like that. Ethics are pretty much only really meaningful if in some way or form the outcome of what you're fighting against will have an impact on your life, honestly. So um, you cannot there's no way that you can stop students from using it. And also um, from a an actual um, education for social justice, if something makes people's lives easier and, you know, um, it brings some kind of benefit, then why should you stop people from using it, really? Um, and again, this brings me back to some more context so I started my business in 2008 and it initially started off as a creative and poetry creative writing and poetry magazine um, and it was online and then um, cut a long story short I started doing website design and um, from then on about 2011 um, that's when GoDaddy came in and were offering um, domains for like a pound and then there were um, what's the name of the other website um I can't remember but there was one website where you'd literally just Wix I think Wix yeah you just sign up 10 pounds a month and you have the templates done and I remember at that point um that was my business that was my livelihood after I finished my master's I actually just ran my business I was creating websites for businesses in Nigeria um and in the UK um literally that was my business creating and it was it was cool because at that time it cost hundreds or thousands of pounds to have a website made um and especially in Nigeria I in the city that I was doing this I was the only female who was doing it I was you know a young female who was doing this so it was really lucrative for me um and I remember because um GoDaddy and Wix kind of came and all you know just literally the demand for a website designer dropped I just diversified and um things moved on and here I am now in 2023 with a completely different business but all came off the backbone of um, my skills as you know a creative entrepreneur somebody who enjoyed graphic design somebody who enjoyed website design and what do I do now um, obviously that incorporates into my actual profession you know I'm a lecturer I'm an educator I teach um, academic English I teach dissertation writing research writing and that um, actually is an amalgamation of what my business is so um, it really is a case of literally chat GTV is here to stay and we as whoever we are researchers educators tutors lecturers we have to work with it we have to work with it um and it's not it's not an us versus them it's not a we versus chat gtp want to see the back of it that's very stupid actually that's something that it's kind of like um a baby throwing a tantrum you can't get rid of chat gtp um from a English for academic purposes, professional perspective, because obviously that's what I do. I teach English for academic purposes at higher education level. Um, the start of the reform is basically the way we assess things. So it may be that, you know, um, 
the way that we give people, we give students work to do, to carry out, you know, uh, kind of any kind of research or um, any assignment. And at the end of it is a written ass assessment, an essay, a report or whatever. Um, that may have to change in the way that we administer it. So in the way that, you know, students are allowed to do it and then hand it in. That may have to change. It may have to be a case of, you know, going more on um, exams, which I don't favour because I personally, I've always loved essay writing. It's something that is a strange thing about me. But as a child, I think from about nine years old, I remember nine, I just really enjoyed. I enjoyed writing before then, but specifically essay writing. I had this interest in essay writing from the age of nine. Um, and I did really well in my essays and um, any writing projects in school. And that's kind of why I love what I do today, because I really do enjoy reading, writing and specifically essay writing, project writing, dissertation writing, all that kind of thing. Um, so that's a shame because I do like essay writing. I really do enjoy it. And I enjoyed it when I was in my undergraduate too and, you know, the rest of my study. And a colleague of mine who I was speaking to where um, there were three of us having this conversation. So one colleague was just like, I hated essays. I didn't want to do it. I don't see the point in it anyway. Um, and then my other colleague was like, well, I actually do like essays and I do. And I think for me with essays, apart from the fact that I am just probably nerdy and geeky and I like writing in kind of, you know, formal English and writing about things, um, I think essay writing and the the skills that are embedded with it really um, just made me into a more confident speaker, confident um, in my analysis of things and the way I approach things, the way I look at things, the way I challenge things, whether it's at work, whether it's in just normal day to day if I get you know bad customer service on a plane or in a restaurant I have the confidence based on kind of the way I've been able to um, debate intellectually within a written paper I can you know use that to make points and back up my points and um, expand on my points and conclude and um, it definitely has empowered me in all work, walks of my life and I think um, even in personal aspects of my life which I don't really want to get into but in terms of like even the way that I would deal in you know relationships with family or um, friends I do take a very strategic approach that I would in essay writing and I think that that definitely um, has improved my quality of life so I definitely wouldn't be advocating for you know um, essays to not be an assessment method but also bearing in mind that you know technically people do use AI tools to write essays then um, that is something that needs rethinking and I think um, that is the benefit of being human being human if we hadn't had adapted to change and evolved over how many thousands or millions of years we've been here, the human race would have been extinct, but it's not. I think um, it's fair to say the human race hasn't thrived um, in the way that it does this day in 2023 in the past hundred years. Like in the past hundred years, there's been such a rapid um growth of so many things whether it's industrialization technology or health so many things so I think I don't want to sound too preachy but definitely looking at it from one perspective that yes we are replaceable but that really is something that you should have been comfortable and aware with regardless of having any AI tools you are replaceable as an employee you are replaceable as somebody who is a worker, whether you are a working class worker or a middle class or even upper middle class. You could be an executive in a company. You are replaceable and dismissible. And that is something that you have to address and see how you can diversify your own resources, your own human resources, and also um, take control 
of your own human resources and manpower or whatever you know you have human labor um and don't give all of that power away to one particular institution who can dispose of you because yes chat gtp for sure can spell the end for many different types of careers within education but even without it you literally are and always have been replaceable. So based on that, it's not a case of shit, chat, chat, G, I can't say it, chat, chat, G, P, T, yeah? It's not a case of, oh my God, this monster's here and we're doomed. It's a case of, it's here and we need to re-evaluate in depth how we commoditize and how we, you know, um, diversify and make the best of the resources we have as human beings whether we are um writers researchers authors educators lecturers tutors whatever it is and i think um obviously i think you you won't dispute that being comfortable doesn't aid you in growth um and i think this particular issue of chat gpt um, making us very uncomfortable is exactly what we needed in a world where everything is dynamically rapidly changing it's not a time to be comfortable it's not a time to be comfortable it's a time to really um, reevaluate the way that we work we teach and we learn so I'm going to leave this for now this is not a definitive conclusive chat on the issue I definitely will revisit it and probably take a more um, approach a, a more writing strategy approach to it because obviously that's the the essence for me anyway that's how it directly affects me but I definitely um, I see opportunities and I see things of just you know basically reforming and reevaluating um, myself um, as somebody who I've always been, I've never had my finger in one pie. Um, I am fully aware that I am replaceable and I am dismissible by any institution or company. And that is why I have my finger in many pies and um, I'm able to literally um, turn my passions and my hobbies and skills into other um, monetizational platforms, um, which has benefited me for over 12 years so like I said um, this is a conversation I would like to revisit and continue um, any comments of course you're very free I look forward to hearing what you have to say on the matter um, so thank you for listening and goodbye